Would love to uh, welcome uh, and just do a shout out to Atwater. Atwater, hello. Everybody want to say hi to Atwater? Um, we're so glad that some of you are there watching me for the first time. Uh, those that are online, also welcome. Um, I'm glad that you're watching online. If you can check us out at one of the services live, we'd love to have you do that. But thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, we want to ask all of us to uh, recognize that in this series, we're talking about the power of having on-target values. On-target values. Anybody here last week um, as we kind of kick this off? Um, excellent. About 12 of you were here. The rest of you, I don't know where you were last week, but thanks for coming today. Good to see you. <laughs> Uh, as we talk about on-target values, we can't need to kind of define what we mean by that. Everyone has values. Um, last week, I said three things are critical for us to understand what values are and uh, how, to, how to make on-target values. Uh, so if you're here, you remember that I said the first thing you've got to do is identify your values. Identify. Anybody remember that? Because without identification, you have abdication. If I don't identify what I value, I abdicate to somebody else. I let them decide what I value. So if you don't have on-target values, which we say are God-centered values, if I don't have on-target values, God-centered values, then I abdicate and culture will tell me what matters. And I can easily just get into the, into the current of culture and believe what culture believes rather than what does Christ say and how does Christ uh, distinguish what should matter most versus culture. And so critically, i got to identify them. So we said last week that if you don't have God-centered values, then we want to just give you ours. Okay, I want to offer up five values that we have. I'll review those in just a moment. It's just say, hey, take ours. Take these God-centered values and make them your own. It doesn't mean they're your only values, but they're your ones you're going to say, these are God-centered, on-target values. I understand what I'm aiming at. I understand what I'm shooting for, and now I'm going to pull the trigger. Right? A lot of people say, I'm aiming to do that, Pastor, but they never pull the trigger. So we want you to aim, shoot, fire, and hit the target. The second thing I said was critical, not just to identify, but anybody remember what it was? What was it? Clarify. Clarify my values because I can identify what I value, but if I don't clarify, I miss the details. I, I kind of miss the, the nuances that should permeate that sense of value. And what, is, what are the implications of that? Because without clarification, you have poor implementation. Without clarification, you've got poor implementation. Well, we want, by all means, for you to implement your values well. Today, we're going to talk absolutely about some some ramifications of implementation. The third thing I said was, anybody remember? Fortify. Fortify your values. So identify, clarify, and fortify. Without fortification, you have disintegration. So if I don't fortify what I value, it's going to disintegrate. A lot of people, a lot of people have gone to church their whole life. A lot of people have said, oh, identify what I value. It's, it's my church's doctrine, but they couldn't tell you what it is. It's just kind of my church's doctrine. I've identified it. But there's no clarity and there's no fortification. And so there's eventual disintegration. It just kind of disintegrates around them. So we want to do all three of those things. And I want to do those three, three things every single week of this series. So you come, I'm going to help you identify a little bit more. I'm going to help you clarify a little bit better. And I'm going to help you fortify even a deeper stance and resolve to live out what God says matters most. Our values matter most. Uh, the five values, let's review those real quick. Um, the first one, number one, is the inspired word of God. I'm going to look at that in a little bit and tease out a verse there in your notes. Um, remember that inspired word of God? They all start with the letters I and W. I and... Yeah, I and... I and W, I guess, say it with me, I and W, inspired word of God. The second one is the intrinsic worth of every person. The third one is an intimate walk with God. We're going to start that little section next week. I'm excited about that. I'm so excited about that. Uh, the fourth one is the investment work of discipleship. The fifth one is the intentional witness of unity. Five guys. I don't know. I asked last week for commitment on how many would say, Pastor, in this series, which will take a few months to do, focusing a month on each one, in this series, um, I will commit to committing to memory those five values. Would you do, would anybody say, I'll, I'll commit with you, Pastor, do that? Come on, come on. How many, how many will do that? Yeah, yep, lift it higher, higher, lift it higher. Uh, okay, so yeah, so we want to do that all together. I want to, I want to value more, God values more. I want to, I want to hit the target. Um, so you found something, there should be something on the seat of your chair when you came in. What was that? A Band-Aid. Would you please take out your Band-Aid? Please take out your Band-Aid and figure out how to open it. Sometimes they're tricky, but you find one in, it's got a little split to it. You just open it just like that. Isn't that amazing? Excellent. So take out your Band-Aid. Everybody's gonna, everybody gets a Band-Aid. You matter. You matter, and we're going to give you a Band-Aid. Okay, take your Band-Aid, and I want you to put that right on your forehead. 
And just take your Band-Aid, put it right in your forehead, just like that. Very nice, very nice. Some of you have colored Band-Aids. Pretty lucky, pretty lucky to have a colored Band-Aid. So put your Band-Aid on. Make sure your neighbor has got their Band-Aid on. We just check and see. Make sure everybody's playing. Nobody opts out. Everybody got to put a Band-Aid on. Right there. Right there. You got it? Are they doing okay? People around you got their Band-Aids on? Yeah? Did you not get a Band-Aid? Would you get him a Band-Aid, sweetheart? There's more Band-Aids on the chair here. Anybody not have a Band-Aid? Look around. There's more Band-Aids around. Band-Aids for anybody missing a Band-Aid? We're good. We're good. We're good. Okay. Okay, now, so here's the point. What's that about, Pastor? If someone walked into your place of work with a Band-Aid on their forehead, would you say anything? What would you say? What happened to you? And they might say, I have a boo-boo. Right. <laughs> they might say, I got a little owie there. Or if they're old, they might say, like a little skin cancer right there, like a little, little band-aid right there. But the thing would be is if they've got a band-aid on their forehead, there ain't no hiding there's something going on, right? It's pretty obvious there's a little, a little you know, malfunction going on with the body, and they got a band-aid on their head for some reason, and it might create a conversation. There would be a certain amount of transparency about an issue they have, Right? That's not our mode of operation. We not only want skin-colored Band-Aids, we don't want anybody to see our Band-Aids. We don't want anyone to see the stuff that shows that we don't got it all together. There's some flaws and inconsistencies about who we are. In fact, we want to hide that usually as much as possible. Anybody resemble that remark? Yeah, most of us resemble that remark. We, we want to hide our flaws, not show them. So part of, part of the deal today about you having a band in your head is, is that we want everyone to know that everybody, everybody has issues. Everybody's got boo-boos. Everybody's got problems. And really, even though we try to hide them, it's absolutely true of absolutely every one of us. In the midst of that, we want you to also to embrace and realize our second value that we're talking about today, which is, the, remember what it was? It's the intrinsic worth of every person. The intrinsic worth of every person. Look at your notes. The first, the first review is reviewing our first value, which is the inspired word of God. Word of God. Inspired of God. So look at this scripture. First, 2 Timothy chapter, uh, 3 verse 16, is that right? Yes. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for four things, teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the man of God, and ladies, I'm going to throw you in there too, so the man or woman of God may be thoroughly equipped, say it with me, for every good work. That, that, that's like, that's crazy amazing. Every good work, every good thing that you do or could do is augmented and accelerated if you are in touch with, akin to, meditating on, committed to God's inspired word. God's word changes you. It impacts you. It empowers you. Literally for every task you do in life, you could be better at it because of God's word. That should automatically elevate God's word to a high priority. Would it not? Should it not? And so we're saying to have on-target values, we think God's inspired word is absolutely at the top of the list of things you should value. For it's our number one value because from God's word, everything else I know about God and me, mankind, I learned from his word. I don't have to wonder where do I find truth. I know exactly where to go to find it. God's inspired word. Now those four things, I'm going to suggest, we're going we're to weave those four things through our message of today talking about our intrinsic worth. So teaching rebuking, correcting, and training. I believe because God's Word does that, Jesus was known as the Word of God in John 1.1. 1, 1. The Word of God, Jesus does that. Jesus teaches, rebukes, and corrects, and trains. And some, some of you, he's going to teach you a little something more about your intrinsic worth and others as well today. And for some of you, you might feel a bit of a rebuke today or, or a correction. You might get back on course, back on target to what you should value the most. For others of you, he's going to train you a little bit more or maybe impress upon you your desperate need for training to understand how to live out what God says matters most. 
In this series, that's what I promise you. I promise you every single week I'm going to help you get those four things over and over again. Better clarity, better identity, better identifying, clarifying, and fortifying of what you value and they're God-centered. Every single week we're going to get more on target. So intrinsic worth, let's think about that. Intrinsic worth, a couple of verses there. These are, you know, are we past, is the cards getting passed out? I didn't say you passed out. No one's passed out, don't worry. But the cards got passed out. Okay, so that's your meditation for this month. It's just this month is ending, so you should have a lot of those cards. We've given away thousands of them. Um, So as you meditate on those, we're we're encouraging not just to commit to memory the value, but also the verse that goes with it. That's really pretty important. Why? Because it reaffirms the inspired Word of God. I not only know what I believe, but I know where in the Bible it says I should believe it. So in Genesis 1.27, it says, so God created, let's say it together. Ready, set, go. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Massive implications. Mankind has been made in the image of God. No doubt about it. We're not necessarily, just because we are image bearers doesn't mean we're bearing that image real well. Doesn't mean we're showing God real well, but that's what the church is about. The church is about restoring our ability to live out our task of being image bearers well to bear the image of God so others see God in us. That's our task. That's our job. I hope you're saying, I'll be part of that job. I I need that. I need help to know how to do that. The second verse, Psalms 139, verse 13 and 14, we can say this together. For God created my inmost being. He knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Isn't that an awesome passage? That the, not the moment you were born, but the moment you were conceived, God saw you, knew you, said you mattered. You had value, you had worth. It was intrinsic. It was inborn. It was indigenous. All synonyms for intrinsic. Um, that word intrinsic. If we tease that out a little bit more, what would it be? I've got a, um, I've got a bill here. It's a $50 bill. Would anybody like it? Very good. Where were you earlier when we were saying how many have memorized scripture? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you want that fifty-dollar bill? That's that's cool. Uh, you know, that's. Do you know who's on the bill? Anybody know? Well, I'm sorry. That. Oh, Grant. There you go. Grant. Very nice, Stephanie. Good job. So Grant. So this is a this is a valuable this is a valuable bill, right? I just wad it up. I spit on it. I mean, I just kind of grind it in. There's all kinds of nasty stuff on this floor. There's, there's all kinds of germs, Germans, Frenchmen, Italians. There's all kinds of stuff. So, uh, so now, look at that. Now, it looks like nothing but a wad of piece of paper. So I would ask, does anybody still want this? Do, anybody still take it? What? What? Lots of people want my 50. Why? Because no matter what it's been through, No matter how it's been treated, no matter how tattered or beat up it looks, you know it has intrinsic worth. Say it with me. Intrinsic worth. You know that that bill has value because there's something in it that no matter where it's been or how it's been treated, it is still valuable. Some friends of mine were uh, at Dodge skiing and uh, we came around um, you know, seven up on the backside. We came around, got off the lift, came around, and there was this bill, this dollar laying on the, on the, on the snow. And uh, as we went past, I thought, that stupid dollar. What's it doing in the snow? Obviously lost its way. And I just went on going, right? No, I stopped and I picked up that dollar. Why? Because I didn't care that it was lost. I didn't care that it was neglected. It had value. Just a buck, but it had value, right? I don't know if you've ever felt lost, if you've ever felt devalued or not taken care of, but no matter where you end up, no matter what wind is blowing you in what direction, no matter if nobody knows you exist, God knows you exist because you have intrinsic worth. You matter to him, and by golly, you matter to us. You matter to us. 
Because we as a church, we want the implications of that to be absolutely permeating everything we do. So no matter who someone is, when they walk through our doors, they recognize, wow, I just feel like I, I'm accepted here, that I can come here no matter where I've been or what I've done. And, and they're not going to judge me or condemn me, but they're going to meet me where I am and love me to a better place, to a place where Christ says he can literally be seen in the fabric of who you are. I believe that God wants to do that in you. Do you want him to do that in you? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's awesome. Do you want him to do that through you? Wouldn't that be amazing? For you to be a conduit of God's intrinsic valuing of others. Point number one in your notes is everyone matters. Everyone has value. Everyone has value. And so if everyone has value, we want to understand how did Jesus kind of communicate everybody has value? The whole teaching idea that Jesus taught over and over and over again. I could give you multiple illustrations of this, but just one for openers. So Jesus taught that everybody has value. Classic case, Matthew 10, 29. Look what it says. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Pause for a moment. This is a great deal, right? I mean, <laughs> two for one. Two sparrows for one penny. Right? Pretty good deal on sparrows today. I mean, when's the last time you were out buying? I mean, what are they going for these days? <laughs> okay, so, so you're not buying a lot of sparrows these days, are you? What's the deal with sparrows, right? Sparrows was a poor man's sacrifice. Right, so God wanted people to, to come to him, and the Old Testament mechanism for that was a sacrifice lamb, which covered the, the sins of the people. But not everybody could afford a lamb. And that would be a terrible deal, right? I could get to God if I had a sacrifice, if I had a lamb. But what if I don't have a lamb? I can't afford a lamb. Lambs are expensive. I can't afford that. Well, hey, two sparrows are sold for a penny. You got a penny, don't you? Right? I mean, you're more likely to find a penny than a dollar bill on the ground, right? I mean, everybody's got a penny somewhere. Open the drawer in your office. Mull around. Pull out the little ice tray if you don't smoke. And look in there. Are there pennies in there? That's where I keep mine. Anybody? Well, you have ashes in yours? That's okay. We love you where you are. Smoke and won't send you to hell. Oh, no, smell like you've been there, but she won't send you to hell. No. So whatever's in your eyes straight, you can find a penny in the, in the floorboard of your car. You can find a penny and two sparrows are sold for a penny. Jesus says, that's amazing. That's a good deal because the poorest of the poor can find their way to God. And so he said something that everybody knew. None of us knew that a little bit ago. We're going like, what's the deal with sparrows? Are they normally more than a penny or is this like a sale? Is this like, you know, um, Amazon Prime Day? For sparrows? Nope. Two, two sparrows for a penny was what they understood. Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. He says, God knows that when one of those sparrows gives up its life, and even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. And I know from paying attention to you, some of you, that's no big deal. <laughs> There's, that's not hard. I could, I could do that. But others of you have this whole wad of hair. It's like, whoa, that's a lot of hair, dude. And he says, God has the very hairs of your head all numbered. Now, it doesn't, it doesn't say that he knows how many hairs you have. He means that when that one fell, it was 286. He knows the number of the hair that fell from your head. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. You see what Jesus was doing? He was taking something they understood as very common and a way to get forgiveness. And that for the common, for the poorest of the poor, there's a way to do that. But even beyond that, every one of us, no matter if we have a lot, could afford a lamb or could not afford a lamb, can make good sacrifices or, or don't know if we could at all. God says, you matter to me. You're worth more. Your father knows about you. I know the numbers of the number of your hairs. I know what they're numbered. I know all about you. You matter. Why? Because everyone matters. I hope that you grew up in a home that, that taught you that everyone matters. Most of us didn't. Most of us grew up in homes like, like all homes that would kind of pick some people as good and important and lovely and others as not so lovely and not important and we well, pulled away from. But if you follow Jesus, then everyone matters and you begin to discover that. And I hope that you're discovering that. I hope you'll discover that with us. Remember this scripture? John 3.16. If you've not read it in the Bible, you've certainly seen it at a football game, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Think about that amazing description of God's love. Jesus, again, in John chapter 3, teaching about how everyone matters. 
For God so loved the world that he, that he gave. I, I've given before. I've, I've, I've been generous. I've, I've given to my family. I, I've given to my friends. I've been generous. But notice the next verse in Romans 5, 8, where it says, but God demonstrates his own love for us. And this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, we tend to value and give to those we value. We give to them. But we also have people that we wouldn't even think of giving to because we don't value them. And God says, because I value the whole world, I've given the whole world access to me through the sacrifice of my son. Why? Because everyone matters. Everyone matters. Now, we know that that's not true everywhere we go, right? We know that's not true everywhere we go. The reason for that is, number two in your notes, is because every culture has value criteria. Every culture has value criteria. And that value criteria says some people matter and some people don't matter. Some people matter because of this or that. I mean, eth ethnically, Ethnic diversity abounds. We are a melting pot in America of every different ethnicity. And if you're around any one of those ethnic groups, you might see and recognize that within that certain ethnicity, they value some things more than others. Or do you have enough beat on that for your own ethnicity, your own clan, your own people you're with, right? And sometimes we reject others because they're different than us, because they don't fit our culture. Because every culture creates value criteria, things that matter more than something else. Um, politics, right? If you're part of a political party, that political party has a value criteria and certain things and certain people and certain ideas, they value more than others. And you know pretty quickly if you're on the opposite or the wrong side of whatever that political persuasion is. Have you ever felt the enmity of politics? Right, that's why they tell you not to talk about it, right? Stay away from that topic. And then they throw in what else? Don't talk about religion and politics. Right? Because oftentimes, churches, oftentimes people where you should find the most acceptance, you find the most rejection. And no wonder C.S. Lewis told a graduating class at Cambridge University that no greater temptation would face them than the urge to create an inner ring of community that was special because it excluded others. Cambridge, impressive place. Graduates, impressive people. Warning from C.S. Lewis. No greater temptation would face you than the urge to create an inner ring of community that was special because it said somebody couldn't be involved. Have you ever been a part of that conversation? ever been tempted in some way, shape, or form to kind of want to create an inner ring of community? I think most of us have. You know, whenever I don't like Joe, if your name is Joe, this is not about you personally. <laughs> when I don't like Joe, though, it's come here and find somebody else who doesn't particularly like Joe. Now I have an inner ring of community of two people who don't like Joe. I feel comforted in the fellowship of someone who feels the same way I do in our mutual agreement to exclude Joe. Anybody ever been a part of that conversation? Where you kind of find this affinity. Oh, you don't like them. Oh, I don't like them either. I, oh, they said this. Oh, I oh, no, they said that. Oh, I can't stand that. Oh, and all of a sudden we have this little fellowship and we feel so close, right? Because we're both agreeing that we don't like someone else. Joe, not Jeff. <laughs> Everybody likes Jeff, don't they? No. <laughs> so you can find a fellowship of two people who don't like Jeff. Ah! But that fellowship all of a sudden creates this sense of, hey, we're special because someone else is less special. And God says, that's not my heart. You missed the point. God wants us to recognize there's this criteria that every culture has. And so one, identify, clarify, and fortify. I got to identify that if I value everyone, that goes against cultures. Because cultures create that. I think that Jesus not just taught about value, but I think Jesus rebuked whenever there was a lack of value of people. Look at a little text with me. Mark chapter 2, verse 14 through 17. Quick little passage here. Look at this. It says, as Jesus was walking along, he saw Levi. Most of us would recognize this more as a guy named, by the name of Matthew. 
Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at his tax collector booth. Come, be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up and followed him. That night, Levi, the newly invited, invited Jesus and his disciples to be his dinner guests, along with his fellow tax collectors and many other, what is it? Notorious sinners. Any notorious sinners are here today? <laughs> Some of you are notorious sinners. Welcome. We're so glad you're here. <laughs> Notice what this says. Mark makes the point of saying, there were many people of this kind among the crowd that followed Jesus. What kind? The notorious sinner kind. I love that. But when some of the teachers of the religious law where Pharisees saw him eating with people like that, they said to his disciples, why does he eat with such scum? When Jesus heard this, he told them, I think this is the rebuke, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I have come to call sinners, not those who think they're already good enough. I think that was a little bit of a rebuke. Jesus calling them out that, that the purpose of his coming was to call sinners, people that recognize there's brokenness and things that are messed up, in their life, that they've got a, a band-aid on their forehead and they know it. They got a band-aid on their heart. They got a, their wraps, there's wraps around their soul because their soul's bleeding and aching for acceptance and to find someone who will recognize they have worth even amidst of all their struggles and failures. So Jesus challenged them to think about the real value of each person. And I love it. It doesn't say that the, the religious people were good enough. He says, who think they're already good enough. Have you ever thought you were good enough and so you were better than those who were not? There is that vulnerability for every one of us because we all have a, a sin nature that kind of distorts not only our own value oftentimes, but certainly casts a shadow on, a shadow on everybody else's value. And Jesus wants to confront it and challenge us because every culture needs to recognize that there's this value criteria and God wants to kind of rebuke and challenge that. Um, a couple things. Let's look at several points. Under this whole idea, Jesus confronted it in Mark chapter 2, the religious culture. The Message Bible says, what kind of example is this? These are the religious guys. What kind of example is this? Acting cozy with riffraff. Did your mama ever use that word? Don't hang out with riffraff. Anybody ever riffraff? Are you a riffraff? <laughs> Hello, I'm a part of the riffraff crowd. Will I be accepted here? <laughs> no, you're not supposed to hang out with that kind of people. Why? Because oftentimes in religious places, we can get the feeling that we are not accepted. We don't belong here. And he, I, I, some of you, most of you are excited about Jesus. That's why you're here. Many of you are, are pursuing a deeper connection and relationship with God than you ever have. That's, that's so awesome. But some of you in the past have not been interested in Jesus because you were rejected by someone who said they knew Jesus. You weren't interested in going to church because the church wasn't interested in you. In fact, when you went, you didn't feel accepted. You felt rejected. You didn't feel loved. You felt condemned. You didn't feel wanted. You felt not wanted, unwanted. You see, part of what God wants us to do is to recognize that even the church sometimes can have value criteria that doesn't match who Jesus was. And so Jesus came to set the record straight. He came to say, you matter. You matter to me. No matter what you are, what color you are, what economic status you are, no matter if you have a lot or a little, you're broken or you're well, you matter to me. Come to me. All you are weary and burdened, come and I'll give you rest. Come and connect with me. God wants us to recognize that value criteria is critical for us to understand, even in the house of faith. Because sometimes the house of faith was the place that we learned we are not accepted. Oftentimes, there's kind of a feeling in religious circles. And the feeling is this, or the, or the unspoken kind of paradigm is, is you come and if you look like us and you believe what we believe, then you're accepted. Have you ever had that experience? You come and you look like us and you believe what we believe and, and then you are accepted. Uh, I can remember, you know, times when I would walk into a place of worship and, and I didn't realize it was pretty traditional and I was underdressed. And they were not underdressed. 
and I felt like I stuck out like a sore thumb. Anybody ever have that happen? You walk in and everybody's in a suit and tie and you're like, oh no, I don't know if I fit very well. And everyone's going, who's the underdressed dude? Right? <laughs> ever have that happen? It's funny because the opposite happens here. Someone comes in a suit and tie and you're going, <laughs> but, but it's, not, it's not like they're not welcome. It's just like, oh, we're so surprised to see you. You look so nice. <laughs> welcome. Please come in. You're raising the bar, aren't you? Okay. <laughs> I think the church should do just the opposite rather than say, you need to look like us and believe what we believe so you can be accepted. I think the church needs to kind of flip that around and say, no, no, if you come, know that you will be accepted so you can wrestle with what you believe so you can look more like Jesus. That's the point. We come and we recognize, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I, I want to come. Will this be a safe place for me to really consider a radical change? Yeah, it is. And we'll walk with you and wrestle with you and all that so you can wrestle with what do I believe so you can begin to look more like Jesus. And when that happens, you begin to kind of find something different. You find a different kind of culture because every culture has value criteria. Here's another one that Jesus confronted. Um, we're going to see kind of how it was set up and why it was an issue. If you were in the first century and you had a kind of a white sore develop on your skin and all of a sudden another sore, another sore, they would say you were probably a leper. And so they would decide that you had to do certain things. And it wasn't an arbitrary decision. It was based on the law. So the Levitical law in Leviticus chapter 13 says, if you ever have leprosy, you must tear your clothes, leave your hair uncombed. Some of you look like you have leprosy. <laughs> Fix your hair, would you? Come on, you're sending a mixed message here. Cover your lower part of your face and go around shouting, I'm unclean, I'm unclean, I'm unclean, unclean, unclean. Well, wow, wouldn't that be like the craziest thing in the world they have to do? I mean, all of a sudden, you, you have these sores, and they say, you can no longer be in the community, go out of the community, and if you ever get around any people, you got to yell out and scream, unclean, unclean, like, stay away from me, right? Not only are there the unacceptable in society, there's the untouchable in society, because every culture has value criteria, and some people are untouchable. A little over a decade ago, I went to Zambia, and it was interesting. In Zambia, there literally, the statistics said that every single family in Zambia had lost a member of their family to AIDS. And I went into several of the medical um, environments, and it was very consistent. Every one of them had gloves. Every of them was very, very protective to not touch someone who might be able to contaminate them. And sometimes in cultures, we can see some people as untouchable because every culture has value criteria. The next one is interesting because it was as close to home as it possibly could be. It was Jesus' very disciples talking about a learning culture of discipleship. In Matthew chapter 19, it says, Then little children were brought to Jesus, sounds like a good idea to me, for him to place his hands on and to pray for them. But his disciples rebuked those who brought them. They said, get those kids out of here. Right? Do you ever have someone say, children will be seen and not heard? Anybody have that one? My, my mama had, I love my mama. She's an awesome sweetheart. But she had this thing with us. If we were somewhere, she would say, one, two, one, two. If we were talking and we shouldn't talk, she would say, one, two, one, two. You know what that meant? It didn't mean one sparrow for two pennies. No, she wasn't saying it. didn't mean that. It meant that you got one mouth and you got two ears. You'd be twice as much listening as you do talking. <laughs> that was code for shut up. <laughs> shut up. You just shut up. <laughs> right. Some, some cultures say children don't belong here. And in the culture of the disciples, where a rabbi was teaching, children did not belong there. Children didn't belong there. They were a non-person. In fact, literally the Roman culture, children were kind of like non-people. They had not yet come to a place where they were valuable. They didn't have intrinsic worth. They had performance worth. And if you couldn't perform, you weren't worth anything. So literally in Roman culture, if you didn't want your child, you could set him outside the city gate and just say, I'm done with him. I don't want him. 
You could take a baby, an unwanted baby, and set it out the gates and just let the baby die. The early church came along and scooped those babies up. Why? Because the early church understood that for you created my inmost being and you knit me together in my mother's womb. I'll praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made no matter if nobody recognizes it. God recognizes it. and Therefore, through the church, we want to recognize it and reach out and embrace those little ones. Every culture has value criteria. You're unacceptable, you're untouchable, you're unimportant, you're unesteemed. And some of you feel like maybe some of that refers to you. It's our culture, what culture does. I, um, during the fires, so, thank you, by the way, so many of you reached out to us when, when Mariposa was um, being evacuated and, and um, our whole area was threatened up there. I had a lot of you that text me and say, hey, Pastor, if you need anything, let me know. I got a trailer. Do you all come haul you out of there? You know, call me anytime. Thank you. That was so sweet. I had a lot of you do that. It was amazing. On Wednesday, a um, week and a half ago on Wednesday, um, the sheriff, who I've kind of built a relationship with and friendship, he's my neighbor, uh, got a text from his wife saying, hey, um, sheriff says you ought, to, you ought to get ready to evacuate. And so we were here as the middle of a staff meeting. I says, guys, I got to leave a little bit early and flew up there. Had to go the back way, right, because 140 was closed. And so I had to kind of go the back way. So I went, you know, down 99 to 145 to 41 to 41 to Oakhurst to 49 over to where we live. And by the time we got there, sure enough, I mean, ash was falling. The sky was so filled with smoke, the sun was just this faint little orange glow in the sky. And uh, we had to make a decision. We had to go in and decide, what are we going to take? I needed some value criteria. I got a whole house of stuff, right? And so we went in, and, and right away, I knew what I was going to take. Right away. I went into my office, and I pulled out some of my favorite Bibles, a few of my favorite books that you know are all marked up, and put those in a box, grabbed my my passport and my, my birth certificate, put those in a box. And then I had to choose of my antiques. A lot of you know that, you know, I grew up in a family that uh, been in the antique business for 50 years. And uh, so I got a house full of antiques. So out of all the antiques in my house, what would I take with me? And so I think I'll run some pictures, I think, um, of some of those antiques. So one of those was my, this table, which is a beautiful little kind of parlor table that uh, is amazing. It's a great, beautiful oak table, 150 years old, just, a, just amazing carving, fabulous legs. I know you got nice legs too, but, but this is, these legs in this table are really nice. I, I said, I got to take my tables, and I was referring to this table, and then my other table, um, which is our, kind of our dining room table. It's very unique. It's called a roll-top table, and, the, and the, so I've never heard of that. That's because it's a one-of-a-kind. You pull on both sides, and it pulls out an additional three feet on each side, little oak slats that roll down underneath the table when it's pushed closed. And so it can go from seating six to 16. Beautiful table. It took me 52 hours to refinish that table. Um, so I said, you know, I'm taking my tables. <laughs> so I turned my tables over, took out the screws, put them in my pickup truck. What else am I going to take? Well, I thought... I better take my chairs. My chairs are really cool. I just thought, I'd be sick if here I am with a pickup truck, more room, and my house burns down, and I didn't take my chairs. So I'm taking my chairs. My chairs are also 150 years old. I picked them up two or three or sometimes four at a time. I've got a bunch of them. Every one of them I had to take completely apart and completely regrew, sand, stain, and finish six to ten hours per chair. So I've got my chairs, and, and so I have six around the big table and four around the little tables. So I'm taking those ten chairs. I have a few more that, a uh, few more, anyhow. You know, so I've decided to, they all match. They were all from the same company in the East Coast that made those chairs 150 years ago, and I picked them up. Two of them, when I got them, were painted yellow. One of them was painted red. One of them had a bullet hole shot through the, to the back of it. All kinds of crazy places these chairs were. Most of them were pretty rickety when, when you first sat in them. Now all of them are solid and beautiful and used, and, and they're great. I love them. So I'm taking my chairs. So I stuck those in my pickup, and I, and I threw a tarp over the pickup. You know, kind of, um, there it is. It had little eyelets around the tarp, and I wove some, some rope through all the little eyelets, and I anchored that down in all four corners of the pickup, and off I was down 49, down 41 to 145, over to 99, over to 99, over to Arbolita. You know Arbolita? You all know Arbolita. You're from Merced. Arbolita, down Arbolita, across Yosemite Avenue, over to my kid's house, pulled in at 10 o'clock at night. I thought, I had, to, I had to 
bring my stuff. I had to get it out. But I knew what mattered. Why? Because I had value criteria. I mean, if your house is burning down, what would you take? Would you kind of be running around in circles not knowing what to take? Or would you have identified, clarified, and fortified and said, I know what to take. I'm getting that. If I've got half an hour, I know what to take. The truth is every one of us have value criteria. What matters most to you? Does what say God says matters most? Does it matter to you? Or do you need number three in your notes? Because every culture needs value correction. Every culture needs value correction. We need someone to kind of say, you know what? You're off target here. You're, you're not hitting the target. You need to be brought back to what God says matters most. Let's get clear about that. So, why? so we can fortify that. And I think that's exactly what Jesus did. Why? Because test. Hey, hey, who needs this one? Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Excellent. Very good. You look good. Thanks for not going anywhere. Okay. Every culture has value criteria and every culture needs some value correction. That's the job of the church. The church's job is to give value correction to help the culture when it's off. Those that say, I love God. Well, do you really love God or do you say you love God? Have you not only identified but clarified and fortified your values? That if not, then let us get you back on track. So notice how Jesus does it. He says in Mark chapter 2, verse 17, our text we look at, when Jesus heard this, he told them, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. It was his rebuke and his correction. I have not come, I've come to call sinners, not those who think they're already good enough. He brought correction to the religious community, or he was trying to bring correction to the religious community. The next one in Matthew, um, this actually I believe is Mark. Uh, I think there's a mistype here. Uh, a man with leprosy came to him. Can you imagine this? He came to him and he begged him on his knees. Now, I'm assuming that right before he begged him on his knees, he was shouting, unclean, unclean, right? He was letting people know he was approaching and as he's unclean, unclean, and he's coming and everybody's leaving, unclean, unclean, and everyone's leaving. Jesus isn't leaving. Standing his ground, the man comes to him on his knees and says, if you are willing, would you make me clean? Notice what Jesus says out of this emotion of being filled with compassion. Jesus reached out his hand and he did what nobody else would do. He touched the man. And said, I am willing. Be clean. Be clean. That day must have been the most amazing day of his life. In that moment, having lived for who knows how long, with no one willing to come near him and, God forbid, touch him. Can you imagine living in a world where you were not touched in any way, shape, or form. Jesus sees him, has compassion on him, and touches him, and his world was rocked. That all by itself would have been enough to create a spirit that went from death to life, from rejection to acceptance from hopelessness to hopefulness. God wants to touch you. Some of you have been involved in some things in your past that were abusive. And because of that abuse, you've perceived yourself to be an untouchable. Not because you want to, but because you're not sure you could trust the other party that might touch you. And God wants to reach into your world, and he wants to reveal with compassion that he will love you and never abuse you, that he will actually take wherever you are and restore you to the place where you can be from his grace because he values the untouchable. He values the unacceptable. And the third one, coming back and creating a full circle of all those examples before, is that learning culture where Jesus tells the disciples, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, 
for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Sets his own disciples straight in that learning environment. Let the children come. They matter. It doesn't matter how old or how young you are. You matter. Why? Because every culture needs someone to put them back on track to get value criteria clear. And God wants to do that in all of us. All of us need to understand that everyone has value. Every culture has value criteria. Every culture needs value correction. And number four in your notes, everyone, every person needs value training. We need value training. Why? Because the culture around us says some people matter and some people don't. But God says you matter and I want you to know you matter and I want you to be trained on how to communicate to others that they matter. And so when Jesus called Levi to come follow him, and it says that so Levi did. He, he left to be his disciples and followed him. That word follow literally means to walk the same road as. To walk the same road as. Now, I can, you can come to a room, an educational environment, and I don't know what your values are, right? I mean, you're here, so I suppose you value God at some level, right? You could say in a moment that you value this, that, or the other thing, and you might, and, but I, how would I know, really, if, I just, if you just say you value it? How would I know you value it? But if I walk the same road with you, uh, I would pretty much find out what you value, right? I mean, you're walking with that other person. You're going to say, oh, well, you, 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 don't, you didn't treat that waitress very well. You didn't treat that guy that washed your car very well. You didn't acknowledge that clerk when they acknowledged you. You see, if we walk the same road together, I can pick up pretty quick what you valued and what you didn't value, and if you value the intrinsic worth of somebody else. But if we walk with Jesus, what would we see? We would see Jesus over and over and over again valuing people that others rejected. Remember the Gospel of John? Yeah, Matthew, Mark, there it is, third one, right? Remember that one? You follow John's narrative, and all of a sudden you get to chapter 3, and you hear about Nicodemus, this religious guy, this Pharisee that was, you know, condescending and, and judgmental and, and superior than others. And he asked Jesus, would he meet him at night for a conversation? kind of, meet me at night. Would you do that, Jesus? And if I would have been Jesus, I would say, if you don't have the courage to meet me in the light of day, don't meet me at all. But Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus says, he meets him at night. Nick at night, there he is. Connects with Nicodemus and gives him a listening ear and a compassionate heart. And some believe that Nicodemus was a follower all the way through. He met him where he was. He gave value to him, even though he was critiquing everything about Jesus and his disciples. You move to the next chapter in chapter 4. Remember, that's the woman that was at the well that had how many husbands? Five husbands and shacked up with a guy that wasn't her husband. Huh? Wow. A lot of people would say, she's not the kind of girl you hang out with. And Jesus spent an afternoon with her, which created a lifelong commitment to him. Because why? He understood that some people are unacceptable, but he's going to accept them. Some people are untouchable, but he's going to touch them. We get to chapter 8 in John, and we discover the woman caught in the act of adultery, brought there by the religious leaders, saying, shall we stone her? Because the law says we ought to stone her. And Jesus does not reject her, but accepts her when everyone else rejected her. You see, to walk the same road with Jesus, you learn that, that everybody has value. You and I, we need to walk that road. And you're invited to walk the road. Walk the road with me. Walk the road with our staff. Walk the road with one of our small groups. Walk the road with Jesus and discover how we as a church, because the implications are immense, you and I get to communicate to everybody who walks through these doors, everybody that's at our workplace, everybody that lives in our neighborhood, no matter their color, race, background, we get to communicate that they matter. And when they get that, they not only want to know us more, they want to know the one that motivates us more. You want to do that? Five of you do. I got six, now seven, eight, nine, eight, nine, 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 nine. Thank you, beautiful, you're beautiful. Coming down from, from Mariposa with my chairs, right? Coming down, I, I pull in, and I brought, I brought one of my chairs here to show you. It's a uh, um, nice chair, huh? Yeah, I like it. 
Uh, this can be a little more hard for me with uh, just a hand mic. But um, so um, I loaded up my chairs, ten chairs, right? I had five around the one table, and and so as I uh, was coming uh, back, and I pulled into our kids' yard, and I got out of the pickup, I I I turned and got out of the pickup, and and uh, my tarp was gone. You know, the tarp that I covered my chairs with was gone. I hadn't tied down my chairs. The tarp was holding them in. Uh, right? So I'm saying, I thought I had more chairs than that. I count one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five. I had ten chairs. And then there were six. I was like, oh, no. My little heart just, it was 10 o'clock at night, and my wife's on the other side of the truck, and she's kind of recognizing, you know, that, that I have just been, like, hit by a truck, right? I'm just like, oh, my gosh. And she goes inside. My son-in-law comes out, puts his arm around me. I'm sorry, Dad. <laughs> no, I, I didn't cry, but I felt like it. Right? I mean, that was all. Oh, man, I just invested so much in those. They're beautiful. Oh, my gosh. I couldn't believe it. And I says, I got to go. Got to go where? I got to go look for my chairs. He goes, want me to go? I go, you got to get up early in the morning. I don't know how long it's going to take. 10 o'clock at night, I went back out, got in the car, left the truck there, got in the car, driving on the wrong side of the road, right, with the lights in the ditch. Whenever another car comes, I move out of the way. Back on the wrong side of the road. Drove all the way down Yosemite Avenue, no chairs. Turned on to Arbolita, going down all the way to 40, 140, no chairs. That's going over this railroad tracks. Did you get that? Did, did, you, did you know that? that was, you knew that, what that was, right? Over the railroad tracks. Down a little bit further, you know, past childs, no chairs. A little bit further, all of a sudden, there's the tarp! Ah, there's the tarp! Pull over, go out, grab the tarp. No chairs around the tarp. Got the tarp, stuck that in the car. Go a little bit further and, ah, ah. Oh. There's a chair. There's a chair. Oh, it's awesome. You ain't got no legs, but there's a chair. <laughs> Do you like chairs with no legs? No, I prefer the kind with legs. Thank you very much. But hey, the good news was the legs were in the ditch. It's awesome, right? So I got my chair. It's got legs, or at least most of the legs. And uh, that's awesome. I'm going, yes, it's great. A little bit of hope stirs in my heart. I drive a little bit further, a little bit further. I'm all the way to the turn, you know, where it meets the freeway. And it's like, I don't see chairs. I just see stuff. I see stuff all over the road. I see stuff all over the road. And my chairs were obliterated. They'd fallen off. And even while I was observing my chairs, a semi was coming around the corner, you know, honking. It's 11 o'clock at night. And he over some of my chairs. And I thought, that's probably what did it. <laughs> One of the lessons I learned that night was, you can fall off a truck and maybe survive, but don't get hit by a truck. <laughs> Probably won't survive. You can fall off the wagon, just don't get run over by the wagon. I went and I, I just started walking around and, and, you know, picking up the pieces. I just started picking up all the little, I mean, every little piece I could find all along the road, probably about 100 yards spread all around, you know, this side of the ditch, that, picking up all the little pieces. I would get as many as I could hold, wrap in my shirt, go to the car, put them in the car, pick up more pieces, as many as I could hold, bring them back, put them in the car, as many pieces. The next morning, got up early, and my daughter and I went back, and we found more pieces why would I pick up every little broken piece of my chairs? Because I love my chairs. Because I value my chairs, no matter how broken they are. And some of you feel like my chairs. You feel like you've been hit by a truck. 
You feel like something has dismantled the very joints of your life and you're in pieces. The crazy thing is, that was Wednesday night and Thursday morning. Friday night, we're having dinner with some friends in town and they were going to be gone this weekend. And so um, I had told them a little bit about you know, what happened. I said, well, I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you everything. So I, I told them the whole story. And they said, we saw your chairs. We were on Arbolita that night. I go, you were? Yeah. Well, we had to swerve to miss those chairs. <laughs> That's exactly what I said. I said, why did you stop and pick up those chairs? <laughs> Don't you value chairs? So we had some fun with that. <laughs> but isn't that life? I mean, don't some of us go by and we see somebody with a broken life and we just swerve to get out of their way? We just do our best to kind of go, well, that was crazy. They're crazy. Man, are they a wreck? Looks like they've been hit by a truck. And you know, don't we kind of do that? We kind of avoid anybody that looks like their life is fallen apart, and yet God calls us, the church of Jesus Christ, to accept the unacceptable, to touch the untouchable, to esteem the unesteemed, and to see as important those who no longer see their importance. I want to be a part of a church like that. Do you? Do you? Whenever we are that kind of church, you can't keep people away. Because people of every size and shape have some kind of brokenness, some kind of failure, some kind of falling off. And they need somebody to know that they will pick up the pieces of their life. And I want us to be that kind of church. I want us to be value-driven so we pick up the pieces of the lives that are broken around us. And if you and I aren't valuing the intrinsic worth of others, if you and I are not learning how to teach, rebuke, correct, and train ourselves for righteousness, for the task of loving others deeply and well, if you and I aren't valuing them and picking up the pieces of their life, we're only offering them a Band-Aid. And the world we live in needs a heck of a lot more than a Band-Aid. Amen? Just bow your heads with me, and would you just maybe come with me to the place where, where Jesus can, can teach your heart, or He can maybe rebuke a part of your behavior, your mentality, your mindset, so He can lovingly come around and correct your direction, so He can train you to be the you he wants you to be. If you want Jesus to do that, just raise your hand. If you want to be someone that lives on target, raise your hand and keep it high. And with your hands raised, whisper this little prayer with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you. I am in awe that you love me as broken as I am. I commit with as much as I know how to not only love you well, but to love every expression of mankind that has been made in your image that you saw in the womb and valued. Help me to value them too. Restore me to the place where I can be used by you to be an extension of your mercy and grace. And if you don't know Jesus, then you're missing out on the most amazing relationship you could ever find. It's a relationship that will rock your world. It will reassemble your broken parts. It will sand off your rough edges. And it will put a finish on you that puts you in right standing with God. Just say yes to him. You've never done it. Say yes. 
it's as simple as acknowledging I'm a sinner and I'm broken. I've got all kinds of things in my life that are not right. And you love me still. I accept that love. I ask for and receive your forgiveness. I invite you inside. Please take control. Lord, we ask all these things because we want to be people that are on target. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thanks so much for being here this morning. Look forward to seeing you next week as we continue and start the intimate walk with God. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.